Hi, we're live, and I wanted to get here before the 2 o'clock song started because it, I wanted to include it here. So it's going to start in just a few seconds here, but we're live. Here we are. Oh, I thought I'd turn up the volume. Oh, I'm such a loser. All right. I wanted to share that song. The angel Gabriel from heaven came. It's a song version of the story of the Magnificat and how Mary found out that she was going to be the mother of the Savior. And so I wanted to share that and I just biffed it all. I'll play it later. I'll play it uh, next week or something. But it's a really cool song. Now, let me tell you a little something about this song. Um, first of all, uh, if you use the same hymnal I do, the Lutheran Service Book, uh, you can't see the, the title because it's all worn off on mine. The Lutheran Service Book, it's hymn number 356. The angel Gabriel from heaven came. Now, it is an old Basque tune. What is Basque? In case you don't know, the Basque people are an ethnic people that exist right along the border between France and Spain. Now, uh, I studied a lot of Spanish in high school. I found out that the Basque people... Um, very opinionated about whether they belong to France or Spain, but uh, that's a separate issue, I guess. But here, this is a Christian hymn from somewhere around France and Spain. Uh, the Basque people have this hymn. It's a Christian hymn about when Mary found out that she was going to be the mother of the Savior. The angel Gabriel from heaven came. That's what we talked about last week. And, uh, and so... Uh, then it goes on to you know to tell the story, you know, all hail to you, Mary, uh, most highly favored lady. All right, and it's a beautiful tune. Now I did not know that this tune was in the hymnal at first. The first time I heard this song, um, uh, it's sung by Sting, of all people. Sting, you know, Gordon Sumner of the Police. Sting. And he sang this uh, beautiful traditional Christmas hymn uh, on one of those pop uh, C CDs full of pop musicians doing Christmas songs. He sang this beautiful hymn, uh, Gabriel's Message, I think is what it was called. And, and, that, and I thought, this is a beautiful song. And then when the new hymnal came out, I'm like, we have a song in our hymnal that's sung by Sting. So I, I learned it first by, I'm a big fan of Sting's music. Well, a moderate fan. But anyway, uh, so I wanted to play that song. I'll have to play it in just a second here, I think. Uh, it's a beautiful song. It tells the story of both how the angel told her that she was going to be a uh, the mother of the Savior that had been long awaited, and also of how she responds which is what we generally call the Magnificat. Now, let's try this again. Just for a few seconds. So you get a hint here. Now that was not Sting singing. That was a, another Christian group called Jars of Clay. And they're, they're pretty good too. And they, they kind of have that introspective nature about them. You know, that melancholy angst of teenagers. <laughs> um, but which is perfect for this song to sing. Uh, and anyway, so I just, I really love that song. It's not familiar. And that's why if you hear... Um, uh, if, if you don't hear it at church very often, it's because we don't know it very well. And so I can't just, you know, oh, let's sing it again. Because, um, you know, if you keep asking people to sing a song they don't know, uh, it, it, gets, it gets at you. Now, if you just heard the answering machine kick on, that's because the answering machine just kicked on. Um, 
but uh, I'm going to try to talk through it. I closed the door. I uh, was advised that close the door, maybe try to keep the sound out over there. Anyway, let's back up. I'm Pastor Kevin Yoakum from Christ the King Lutheran Church here in Riverview, Florida. This is the Bombs Bible Study, the Book of the Month Bible Study. And here in December, we are going through Luke chapter 1 and 2 and looking at the songs of Christmas, the songs from Luke. And so last week, we started it, and we, we got into the story uh, of Zechariah, and he gets the angel's message, Gabriel's message to him. He's going to be a savior. And, uh, or not that he's going to be a savior. He's going to be a father, excuse me. He's going to be a father. And, you know, you're going to have a son, and your wife is going to have a son in her old age, and you guys are going to have a son. And Gabriel's, or uh, Zechariah's message is, come on. How do I know that you're telling the truth? And uh, Gabriel does this kind of, you know, it's like, are you questioning me? I brought you a message from God. You know, can you imagine an angel? They bring a message from God Almighty, you know, Yahweh Sabaoth, Yahweh Lord of hosts, and uh, from God Almighty. And, and someone goes, now how do I know this is true, right? Come on, all right? And then Gabriel tells the same message to Mary. Mary, you're going to have a child. And she doesn't question. She says, okay, how's this going to work? You know, and it, it kind of looks like they're asking a similar question, how? But you, you see there, if you kind of look at it closely, you can kind of see that, and especially Gabriel calls it. Zechariah doesn't believe. Like, come on, you're pulling my chain. Right, and, and yet Mary, her response of how is really a, a response of faith. All right, so then we got you know Mary's uh, announcement that she would be with child. How and, and you know the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and and you will conceive. Right now, like I said, uh, some people want to take this in the wrong direction and say. Um, let's try to figure out how did Mary get pregnant? All of the intimate details of how this happens between God and Mary. And that's very inappropriate, actually, you know, to try to imagine the biology of this, right? It, it's inappropriate, right, for us to try to imagine even human beings, you know, right? It's inappropriate for us to imagine anything like that and there's no hint that anything in such sordid you know kind of ways that people try to go well how did God do this to Mary let me just try to put this to rest and then I won't talk about it again first of all he says the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and that's it so what's going to happen God's going to do his power and you'll be pregnant Okay, so we don't have to imagine any sordid biological details about this. It's not necessary. God can do things simply by doing things, right? He says, let there be light, and what happens? There's light. He says, let there be mountains and grass and water and fish and gorillas. Uh, gorillas are my favorite. And, and what do you have then? Mountains and grass and fish and water and gorillas, right? Just because he says, let it be. So um, what's happening here? God wants Mary to be pregnant, and so she becomes pregnant, all right? We don't have to go any further than that. We just don't have to. And the, the um, usually it's the biblical skeptics who try to say, how does this gonna work? Well, if God can create a universe with comets in it, I think he can manage the medical details of a human being. And Bible, the Bible is very clear that all life comes from God, right? That God is the one who wills and desires there to be life. So God willed and desired Mary to be pregnant. And that's it. I'm putting it to bed. No more. All right. I've said my piece. 
And so those people who try to be biblical skeptics and try to, uh, that, they don't need to do that, all right? It's a, it's a non-starter. It's a dead topic. It's an inappropriate topic because God is almighty, and so he gets, he gets to do this simply by his power. Moving on, all right? So we're going to be in Luke 1 again today uh, with the uh, Magnificat, okay? And so you're going to want to open your Bibles to Luke 1, verse 39 and following, okay? But let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we uh, come to the scriptures today, we ask that you would open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive what you give us through the scriptures and to take it to heart, to put it in our mind that we might ponder it, that we might grow in faith and knowledge and appreciation for all that you have given us in here. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, this may be a bit of a shorter lesson. Uh, this may be a bit of a shorter lesson, and that's okay because we're only covering so many verses, right? We're not covering as many. Uh, as, you know, Luke 1 has 80 verses. We're not going to do all that, right? We only got up to verse 38 last week. So, uh, we are here, and what do we have? Where did we leave off? We left off with the angel leaving Mary, who had just been told that she would be pregnant. And her answer is, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me as you have said. Right? Verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, my baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is, so, this is beautiful. This is so beautiful. So we have heard Elizabeth is pregnant. And in the sixth month of her pregnancy is when the angel visits Mary and tells Mary, by the way, you're going to be pregnant. And just so you know, Elizabeth is pregnant also, your relative, and she is in her sixth month already. All right. So you get to see here. So Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country uh, in Judah, to, a t to this town in Judah, to the house of Zechariah to greet Elizabeth, to go see, you know, pregnant Mary wants to go see pregnant Elizabeth. Now, why? Well, pregnant Elizabeth is old. We've been told that. No offense against old people, but it's not easy to be pregnant. And it's not easy to be pregnant and old, I imagine. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, maybe she's just going to help out. And maybe she's going to talk to the other person about, hey, Angels keep going around telling us we're pregnant. Uh, who's next? Actually, no one else is next, right, uh, in this story. But so she goes to visit Elizabeth. Now, uh, one other back story from last week. Remember, Elizabeth is pregnant. Zachariah told the angel I, that he didn't believe that this was going to happen. Like, how is this going to happen? Or whatever it could be. How can this be, right? And Gabriel says, uh, because you did not believe, you will be unable to speak, mute, until all of this comes about. So Zechariah has to wait nine months before he can speak. Uh -huh. There's a lot of jokes here, right? You know, finally, Elizabeth gets some peace and quiet. Maybe there's some uh, jokes or some reality about Zechariah having a lot of time to think because he can't speak. Uh, you know, and so... Uh, but we get to verse 41. She greets Elizabeth. In verse 41, Elizabeth hears the greeting of Mary 
and something happens right then, right? Elizabeth hears the greeting of Mary, and, and the Bible says the baby leaped into her womb. Now, it's no secret for us to know that babies kick and turn and move while uh, when you're pregnant, right? It's no secret for us to know that, and it's no secret for us to know that sometimes they react to something happening, right? Maybe there's loud noises, whatever. We understand that there's maybe foods that upset the baby, that there's sounds that the baby might react to inside the womb, right? Now, that means that child is alive inside the womb. He's not a clump of cells, right? He's not a unalive tissue waiting to be alived. This is a living being inside the mother of uh, the womb of the mother, right? Now, for one thing, science tells us this also, right? Christians don't have a problem with science, or we shouldn't. We should have a problem with bad science. Uh, we should have a problem with people who try to use science for an agenda, all right? But the, the scientific definition of life does include unborn life right? It's living. It's inside. It's a separate being growing inside the mother, right? And so the baby leaps and turns and whatever inside Elizabeth. This tells us two things. One thing, uh, you know, in, inside the story, there's something amazing happening between John, who's not born yet, and Jesus, who's not born yet. There's a recognition happening here, right? But the other thing that is amazing is what it ha does to what knowing the Bible does to our modern day discussions of the value of life, the sanctity of life, the when life begins. The Bible's already answered this question in many and various ways. All right. So uh, if we're trying to figure that out as a Christian, we can already kind of go, well, uh, Luke 1 kind of says something about this, right? Because the baby leaps in her womb, and Elizabeth, now Elizabeth, it, it says, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is telling us now, not only is this some joy, some excitement, but because we don't need the Holy Spirit to just give us emotions, but she's filled with the Holy Spirit to give us recognition and faith. She recognizes what is happening. The Holy Spirit, for one, more importantly than saying, oh, I got emotions, you know, like um, some sort of uh, charismatic thing. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I think I'll sing and dance a musical number. Uh, but no, the Holy Spirit is there to draw us into Christ, to bring us faith or recognition or give us the words to say words of faith to others. My nose keeps itching. All right. Uh, so she is filled with the Holy Spirit, and we don't care as much that she's excited. Now, that's important. But we care that she's filled with the Holy Spirit for what she knows now and what she's going to say about this. And so she is filled with the Holy Spirit, and Mary exclaims, Blessed are you among women! Mary, right? Now, we don't know. Did she know Mary was coming or did Mary just show up? Did Mary tell her I'm pregnant or whatever? But she says these words of truth. You have this blessing that no other woman gets to have. That doesn't make her, doesn't make Mary um, more deserving, more worthy. It just means that she's the one who, if you want to call it this, won the lottery. No, but she's the one who was chosen to be this one person. I was thinking about this this week. There were probably many faithful women uh, and, and young ladies and virgins and maidens. It's all about the same thing. Uh, there were probably many faithful people, uh, ladies, young women, faithful to God and believers at that time, it's not like God said, I'm down to one. I got no one else to pick. No, 
I, I'm just guessing, you know, there's plenty of faithful believers today, and there were plenty of faithful believers back then, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises. So God could have chosen anyone. And he's, you know, he had said, well, uh, the baby will be, will come from Nazareth or what, you know, up from up north. Well, there's probably plenty even just in that town. God could have chosen anyone. So it just happens to be that he chose Mary, right? For whatever reason. We don't have to know how many other candidates were likely to be chosen. We don't have to know you know, was was there any any other factors? We just know God chose Mary, and that's enough. And so, blessed are you among women. Now listen to this, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She's praising the child born all, or you know, living inside already inside Mary. Uh, blessed is the fruit of your womb, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> all right. And why is this granted to me? What a blessing it is to me, Elizabeth says. I have the blessing of this, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. You know, I'm blessed because you have come here. Now, it's not, I'm, I'm happy Mary came and it was a blessing. Now, we can all say that, right? I'm happy my relatives came. I'm happy my friends came over. I'm, it was a blessing when someone gave me a phone call, right? She says, the mother of my Lord, Lord, okay, Lord. She says that you, Mary, are the mother of my Lord. She has just said, you know, I'm blessed because you came to visit me. I'm blessed because you are the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. She doesn't know his name yet. Because You're the mother of the Messiah. It really... I'm blessed because you brought the Lord into my presence. Now, Lord, um, you know, uh, this is not some British way of seeing, you know, uh, Lord of of uh, of Windsor or something like that, you know. And it's not just like saying, hey, governor, you know, it's not just some sort of title. In the Greek, when they say Lord Kyrie, Kyrie, right? Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. Uh, when they say Lord, they're really saying God. Right? Blessed am I. Blessed, uh, why is this granted to me that the mother of my God should come to me? Mary, the one you are pregnant with is the Messiah, the Son of God, who is going to be God. See how important this is? Elizabeth is saying some very cool things here, right? Uh, one of my theology professors, uh, um, Professor Jeff Gibbs, he said, in very technical theological terms, the Bible is cool. <laughs> all right, all right. And, so, and actually, theologically, that makes a lot of sense even, just to say the Bible is cool, meaning this Bible is something not just to study like a mathematics equation, but it tells us so much that we should have an appreciation for, a joy over, a thanksgiving for. And here, the Bible is cool. We get to see Mary being greeted by Elizabeth saying, oh, Mary, what a blessing that you have. And what a blessing you are among women. And what a blessing it is to me that you have come and you have brought the Lord to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me, right? Verse 44, For behold, now she explains it, so Mary understands. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped. Now remember, she's speaking by the Holy Spirit now. So I'm going to trust that this word is not like, uh, I assume it's, not just the meatballs I had for lunch, but it's joy. No, she says, she, the baby leaped for joy. It's a he, not a she. Uh, the baby leaped for joy. I'm putting that still under speaking full of the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth is saying what the Holy Spirit needs her to say, what is causing her to say, right? Moving her to say. That this, uh, this child, I'm, you can't see on the camera here, but I keep referencing 
my own stomach. I'm not pregnant, in case you were wondering. But, um, you know, I'm speaking as if I'm Elizabeth. This this baby inside of me is leaping, and, and I know it's because of joy at the sound of your voice because of who you have inside you. The baby inside of me recognizes and knows who is present inside of you. John the Baptist, I'm going to just put it here, uh, clean out. John the Baptist is now recognizing that he is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist is as of yet unborn. Jesus Christ is as of yet unborn. But the unborn child of Elizabeth is saying, the unborn child of Mary is the Lord. And he's leaping for joy. God is present, right? I know, uh, maybe you think I'm overstating it, but I don't think so. I think I'm connecting the dots here uh, to say this is what's happening. All right? Uh, so, uh, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And then, and blessed is she who be <laughs> blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Right? And Mary, you're blessed because you have trusted in God's word that this is coming from the Lord and that what he has said will be fulfilled. What he has said about the Savior will be fulfilled. What he has said about your pregnancy will be fulfilled. Now, I laughed when I started reading that because some have uh, given me this thought, um, you know, who believed and who didn't believe, right? Blessed is Mary because she believed what God told her. Zechariah didn't believe, right? <laughs> now just imagine this, okay? This is the way it was put to me. Just imagine, we don't know. Zechariah may very well be in the same presence too, in the same room or whatever. And, and Elizabeth is going... And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what God told her, right? You know, and, and Zechariah can't say anything back. He's just sitting there going, I know, I know, I didn't believe, and now I can't speak. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a lot of blessings going on here from Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women. And uh, blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus Christ. And really, blessed is me. Why is this granted to me that I get to be in the presence of my Lord, that you have brought him here to me? And, and blessed is the one who believes in God's word, Zechariah, right? But really, that actually comes to us as well. Blessed are we when we believe what God has told us in the scriptures. We hear God's promises, and we say, God said it. That's it. I believe it, right? Um, you know, what a blessing it is when we hear God's what God says, and we say, okay, what's the old bumper sticker? The Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it, <laughs> right? Um, I think it's a bumper sticker. Um, you know, how wonderful that is if we can say, well, the Bible said it. So I'm going to go with it. What else would I do? What else would I do? Question the Bible? That's not going to work. Right? So blessed is she who believed. I keep thinking of, you know, poor Zechariah maybe being admonished again. Maybe, you know, blessed is she who believed what would happen. Now he believes. But what's he to uh, think about after that? You know, it, what, what was he to think before? You know, he certainly was corrected by um, by Gabriel. You will be silent. You won't be able to speak for these nine months until it all comes to pass. All right. So uh, we're we're coming down here. We haven't even gotten to the Magnificat, but now we are. Right? Mary gets to comment now. Elizabeth has said, "Oh, how blessed are you!" Right? And Mary gets to say, "And Mary said." My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, I'm going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to stop here. That's why this is called the Magnificat. And if you ever ever heard, well, there's this song called the Magnificat, but I don't know what it is, or I'm not familiar with it. It's this. And it, Magnificat is just Latin. 
and a lot of times uh, Latin in Latin or in other things uh, you would just name a song by the first couple words in the song right uh, and so uh, sorry about my nose it just itches by the way I I'm here alone you know if I scratch my nose I, I wash my hands and sanitize and things like that um, but um, so it's called the Magnificat simply because here Mary is saying my soul magnifies the Lord um, and so there's that just the Latin Magnificat is magnifying it's praising it's it's showing and, and exclaiming the greatness of the Lord so all right here we go the Magnificat my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her, Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her home. All right, all right, all right. Let's do the last part first real quick, and then we'll probably come back to it again. Mary remained with Elizabeth for three months and then returned home. Now, think about this. What? When did Mary find out that Elizabeth was pregnant? Six months into the pregnancy? How much, how long is it typically talked about that a human pregnancy lasts? Typically about nine months. How long did she stay? Three months. Three months plus six months equals nine months. Give or take some traveling time. You can figure out that maybe Mary probably stayed for the pregnancy, for the birth of John the Baptist, and got to see it. And we, we can guess. We're guessing here. And and maybe a few weeks afterwards to help, you know, you know, burp, uh, heat the bottle, right? Uh, figure out how the diaper wrapper, you know, disposer thing works that everybody has these days. You know, to to help maybe learn some baby skills, or just to help out around the house a little bit until Elizabeth gets her strength up, right? But she stays with Elizabeth during for those last three months. And you think also, isn't that really sometimes one of the harder trimesters, right before the the birth, right before delivery, and and so. Uh, Mary did a great and kind thing, in my opinion, by saying, I, I'll, I'll come and I'll stay with you and I'll help you out during the pregnancy and for the birth. And then afterwards, what does she do? She goes back home. Why? Well, she's pregnant herself and she's engaged and she's got to go back home and, and uh, explain everything to Joseph, right? <laughs> All right. But let's get to the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is good news here. You know, I'm praising God. All right. Why? Well, the second line, and my spirit is rejoicing in God, my Savior. All right. Now, we, everybody has to have a God for a reason. If you think about, you know, what does your God do for you? And, and so think about this for any God. Well, I need a God who will teach me. I need a God who... Uh, will bless me with wealth. Now, these are maybe not the best reasons. Teaching is fine. I need a God who will guide me. I need a God who will punish others, right? I need my God to go get me justice or revenge. Go, go God, do things for me, right? Mary says, this God is God my Savior. And that's very much what God is throughout the Bible. The one who saves, the one who redeems, the one who gives of himself as a sacrifice that we would have life, the one who frees us. That's all part of the salvation idea, that we are 
freed from something. And what is it we're freed from? Sin and, and the, the curse of death and, and the, the power of the devil. That God, my Savior, frees me and saves me from me, from my sins and the punishment of my sins, from, from the curse of everlasting death and from the devil's stranglehold on our lives. And that's what our Savior does. So, uh, you know, you just try to think generically. Uh, people have gods, and what do these gods do for them? And people might seek their God to do something. And if you're seeking the Christian God to only be a God of, of vengeance, or to only be a God of teaching, or to only be a God of prosperity, you're missing the main point of this God. He is a God of salvation. He is a God of forgiveness and a God of mercy for us. He is a God uh, who, who calls us to have a, this wonderful personal relationship, not just a, transact, a transactional God, right? You give me sacrifices, I give you blessings. Uh, no, he's a God with a personality and a desire to have us present with him all right my spirit rejoices in god my savior now what has he done for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant and he sees me in my lowest in my humblest in my weakest i don't have anything i'm not rich and powerful right this is very interesting now this is actually one of the themes that comes through the whole gospel of luke Luke likes to point out these points in Jesus and, and in what others will say of him. It, that there's this, the, the powerful and there's the weak. And God tends to see the weak and not regard the righteous, the, um, the powerful and the arrogant and the strong. And like, oh, they deserve it. No, he tends to have mercy on the weak. And one of these um, themes in Luke is how God likes to do the reversal. He likes to lift up the weak and the humble. And he likes to kind of bring down and, and admonish or punish the arrogantly strong, the self-righteous. All right. So what has God done for Mary? She was nobody. But God looked upon her humble estate. And, and what why what, what what are you talking about for behold from now on all generations will call me blessed and it's pretty much true everybody uh who is christian who knows the scriptures will still call her the blessed virgin mary or something along those lines right right now i'm not going to get into the discussion of uh you know is she still a virgin all right that we'll have plenty of time for that but right now we still call her even in the christmas story the virgin mary or something like that right the mother of Mary, of jesus and from now on everybody's going to point out how blessed she is because she has this unique calling in life no one else in all history gets to say that they are the mother of of the Savior Jesus Christ no one else in all history will be called the mother of God like I said last week when you call Mary the mother of God you're not making her anything but a human you're simply saying that Jesus is God and she's the one who gave birth to him right you're not making God less to say that he was born because what is Jesus true God and true man. And was he born? Yes. Does that make Jesus less God? No. Right? There's also part of a mystery in there that we'll never scientifically understand. We'll never philosophically understand. We hear what God says and we believe it. Right? So Mary, the mother of God, is not an insult to our sensibilities. It's not an insult to God. And it's not a false elevation of Mary. She is the one who gave birth to Jesus Christ. So she is the one who gave birth to God in Christ. So it's okay to call her God. 
and to call to say she's or not to call her God, to call her the mother of God. And to say that she's not the mother of God is actually no and no insult so much to Mary, but it's an insult to Jesus. You know, oh, I'm not God, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Why? Again, these we get these four things. For he who has mighty has done great things for me. Right? I didn't do anything, Mary's saying. I didn't do anything. There's no work of mine that brought this about. But something was done for me. Right? I didn't get myself pregnant. I didn't deserve to become the mother of God. I didn't deserve to conceive Jesus Christ. I didn't accomplish anything that would win me this as a reward, right? There's nothing I did, but the one who is mighty, the one almighty God has done these great things for me and in me, right? I didn't do it. Praise God for all that he has done. For he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. Right now, what has he done in his holiness, in his moral and ethical purity? Someone said one time, "That's holiness. Holiness is not a matter of you know, am I serene or anything like that. It's moral purity. Like there's nothing wrong in me. Ethical purity. I don't have any immor. If I'm holy, I don't have any immorality." If I'm holy, I don't have any unethicalness in me. Now, who is holy? God. And then God increases our holiness. But we're still fighting every day with being a saint and a sinner and, and, and fighting the, our sins and our unholiness and our unethicalness and our immorality. Um, but he who is mighty has done great things for me. And he's the one who's holy, he's the one who is morally pure, who is ethically pure. Um, so we we should, I, I think we could even say there that Mary is admitting that she is not perfect. Because she's saying he did these things. His name is holy. I'm the humble servant, right? I, I'm the lowly person. It's Jesus. It's God. It's God who has done all of these things. And he did them in me and, and for me and, and through me for the world, right? And verse 50, And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. God's mercy in causing her to be pregnant with Jesus Christ is now going to be mercy for the world, for all who would fear God. Now, this is important, too, that we don't need to think of fearing God like we fear spiders. I don't like a loose dog that I don't know, right? I'm a little afraid of a running dog that I've never met coming towards me, right? In much the same way, I would be afraid of a charging car coming towards me, right? But that's not what the fear of the Lord is. The fear of the Lord is knowing God for who he is. He's God. He's creator. He's the judge. He's the holy judge. And who am I standing before the judge? Not much, right? Uh, and, and, who, and so the fear of the Lord is often said to be, you know, awe and, and a worship and a full appreciation of who he is. Like, um, you know, generally, let's say we generally have a proper respect for police and for law enforcement, especially if they're carrying their gun out, right? I remember after September 11th, the National Guard was at almost all of the, of the airports and uh, they would stand, you know, holding their gun, their um, rifle or machine gun or whatever, you know, at rest. But they're holding a gun in their hands and we all had a proper respect for what could happen if I misbehaved around gun-toting military and law enforcement, right? There's nothing wrong 
with proper military, proper law enforcement, and proper uh, law-abiding citizens, right? What would go wrong is if I misbehaved around them, right? And so what goes wrong if I misbehave before God? <gasps> That's the fear of the Lord. That I know and I've, I've, I'm, there is fear in what we call fear when we fear God because we would fear his wrath if we cross him, right? But it's also a love, a fear, love, and trust in God all together. The fear of the Lord is also a worship of God who is great and holy and merciful, right? So his mercy is for those who fear him. He has mercy on people from generation to generation. You know, it's like Mary is saying, from this time forth and forevermore, there will be mercy on all believers. There will be mercy for all who believe in God and for all who, you know, expanding this, believe and trust in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Right? Um, so verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm. Uh, you know, we get to see his power at work. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts, in their conceits, I think one translation says. Um, he has scattered the proud. There's that reversal. He lifts up the lowly. What does he do with the proud? <laughs> Brings them down frustrates their plans, teaches them something, right? Humbles them, brings them down a peg. How many phrases can we think of to say, uh, you know, he taught them the fear of the Lord. He told them, he showed them what it would be like to fear the Lord, right? So he has mercy on those who fear him and he'll scatter the proud, the, the, he will scatter the proud, those who are caught up in their own conceits, conceitedness, right? He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Mary is just full of these reversals because she is telling us this is what God does. He does this. All right. Um, and so verse 53, what has he done? He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Right? Sometimes the rich need to be taught what it means to be rich and what it means to be poor, right? So sometimes God will ruin the richness of people and sometimes we get to see how God cares for and provides for the hungry. He has this concern for the lowly and a righteous and just way to deal with the proud and conceited uh, people of those who have power, right? Um, it's not just wrong to be rich. It's wrong to be uh, sinful in our thoughts when we're rich and about our riches, right? Okay. Uh, verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Uh, so here, Mary is now saying, and this is all according to the ancient promises of Abraham even, right? He has remembered his mercy to Israel, to Abraham and his descendants forever. So, uh, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm going to have a baby. Any of us can say that. Well, anybody who's female and is pregnant, right? Um but, you know, any pregnant person can say, I'm pregnant, I'm going to have a baby. And that's good, by the way. It's good. It's a blessing from God. To, and we should say, thank you, Lord, for giving, uh, creating a new life in me. Right? But Mary is the one who gets to say, and by doing this, he's actually keeping his promises to all of Israel. He's keeping promises that he made a thousand or more years ago to Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Back in the book of Genesis, he made these promises. And now in my child, they're coming to be fulfilled, says Mary, right? Not my child. You know, you understand what I'm saying. Um, and so, you know, what an amazing uh, song this is. This song also, uh, we have every reason to say this is of the Holy Spirit too. For one, if nothing else, we can say 
Well, the Holy Spirit caused it to be recorded in the scriptures. The Holy Spirit caused Luke to find out these words and write them down. Um, and, and so, you know, this it must be of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is causing it to be preserved. So, uh, you know, this song is really, what a song of praise. You know, Elizabeth gets her going in, in such a way. Oh, bless, blessed are you, Mary. Blessed are you. And, and Mary's response is, I know my, my, my soul, uh, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My soul magnifies the Lord. He is so amazing. What he does for me, it's not me. It's what he's done. And it's his mercy towards me. And it's his mercy towards the the whole world and all who fear him he's going to remember all of the poor and the weak and the lowly and the lonely and the sick and those in need of help and forgiveness and salvation that is what God is going to do even through the child he has uh, whose life has begun in me right by the way, we will confess with the whole of scripture and with the whole of the Christian church that Jesus uh, existed as part of the Trinity for all time before creation but it's now that he begins to have a physical human life and now that he begins to be called Jesus which is in Matthew 1 you will call his name Jesus uh, right so uh, you know the second person of the Trinity the Son of God has existed for all time for since before the creation of time for all eternity and, and now uh, we just see him uh, as the, the him would say love came down at Christmas you know now God's God's presence in the Son of Man or the Son of God is is becoming physical and enfleshed on earth okay now uh, I want to say one more thing and then we'll stop early okay Mary's song here, the Magnificat, is actually very similar to a, a passage in the Old Testament. In 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 1 or 2, I should check. Um, there's the story of Hannah. Hannah is a faithful believer, and she is uh, the wife of, of someone, and she is unable to conceive. And she prays to the Lord that she might be granted a child. And she does then conceive and she uh, becomes pregnant and, and is able to give birth to the child Samuel. And, and I'm just taking a little minute here. And so Hannah sings a song of praise here. And I got to find it. I'm almost there. In 1 Samuel chapter 2 first Samuel chapter 2 Hannah's prayer and it's very similar in content and structure to Mary's now should we say there was copying going on no I would say that you know that just like Hannah was rejoicing in the promise of the birth and giving God all the credit for what he does so is Mary right and so uh, they're very similar, but we don't want to say, well, they just copied one another. That, then that diminishes it. I think both are great for increasing, for magnifying the Lord, right? So uh, that's just to point out, and if you want to see uh, Hannah's prayer, Hannah's song, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 2, okay? All right, now uh, this is the Magnificat. After this, next week we have John the Baptist being born and the Benedictus. Uh, all right, that's the song that uh, Zechariah sings. And then just to give you a hint, then we have the angels at Jesus' birth singing Gloria. Glory in, you know, glory to God in the highest. Gloria in excelsis. And uh, all, of our Christian, all of our Christmas hymns are going to come to play there probably. And then the Nunc Dimittis. Uh, is the, the week after Christmas. That's when Simeon gets to sing a song because he has now seen Jesus Christ. Nunc Dimittis, now let us depart in peace. All right? Uh, but now let us close in a, in a, with a word of prayer and then we'll depart in peace and joy. All right? Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this good news again in the Magnificat to get to see and, and share in the joy of Mary that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is coming into the world and God will act in our time and for our good through him. In Jesus' name we pray that you would bless us and strengthen us in these promises every day. Amen. Uh, God bless your day and your week.